Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's open our Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Um, Paul, his, this is the concluding chapter of Paul's ministry as far as writing. It is his last charge, and he's charging his faithful protege in the Lord Timothy, and he comes to Timothy here, that, you know, this, these two letters, but this is his last letter. Um, believe mostly that this is the last thing that Paul wrote. And the, think of this, this, this will be the last words he writes to his protege, to anybody. And he says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Now, let me say this. There's a lot of stuff on the internet, Facebook. I, I'm, just, I'm about fed up with some of you Facebook people. That every time somebody challenges you, don't judge. Who's you, who are you to judge and all this? I'm just fed up with listening to you. You don't know your Bible and you don't read it right. You're, you're, you're shallow and you need to grow up. Because you need to understand that you run around here and do, all this don't judge garbage. You're setting people up because Jesus will come and he's going to judge. And if there, we don't share truth and share things that will help people make adjustments and changes in their life, they're going to answer to Jesus, and you're going to be part of the reason that they, did, they have to answer to Jesus for it. So grow up and stop being a jerk. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Oh, that wasn't love. Yes, it is. Because there are people out there who listen to your stupidity about... We don't judge anybody, and you do whatever you want that makes you feel good, and we don't want anybody to feel bad about themselves. I'm going to tell you something. There will be th when you sin and when you're not living according to the Word of God, you're going to feel bad about yourself. Jesus, the Bible does not say that he came to make you feel good. It came that you might have life, and you might have it more abundantly, and the Bible teaches us on that life. That life causes us to live in a different way. Amen. You say, that's harsh. Yes, it is, because we're living in a stupid society. And it's infiltrated the church. And church, we've got to get back. Not preaching hate. People say, if you say, if you tell me I can't do what I want to do, you're full of hate. No, I'm full of love. Because the word of God tells you not to do it. And I share with you what the word of God shares with you. I'm trying to help you avoid the judge coming and judging the living and the dead. Amen. Listen to this. Preach the word. That's all we're supposed to do is preach for, okay. Be instant in season, out of season. That just means, you know, uh, this, this is a, a phrase that Paul used here. And um, it, it means, keep your, the Amplified says it this way, keep your sense of urgency. Be at hand and ready, whether the opportunity seems to be favorable or unfavorable, convenient or inconvenient, whether it's welcome or unwelcome. We're, speak, we're to speak the truth whether people like it or not. I know some people don't want to hear that. They want to see, see, we're falling for the mantra of the devil that, you know, the PC world. The PC world has invaded the church. You can't say anything because you'll make somebody feel bad. I mean, they're passing laws. Now. New York City just passed laws, employers and stuff, that if they address a person who has a self -identif gender identification of a man when they're a woman and you address them as Mr. or, or, or the, the wrong identity, because of how they identify, you can be fined. Instead of Z and whatever that other one is, Z, E, and X, I, whatever you're supposed to be using those now instead of Mr. and Mrs. It's crazy. It's lunacy. Well, that stuff's coming to the church. And you can't tell somebody that they're not doing right because you make them feel bad. No, we're to, we're to share the truth whether people like it or not. Whether they want to hear it or not. Now, that means you just can't share the stuff people like. Woo, you're going to get, you have an offer, you're going to be rich tomorrow. You're gonna, your house is going to be paid off, your car is going to be paid off. You're going to have a $25,000 guard dog. You're going to have a, a Lamborghini and a Maserati sitting in the driveway. And, you know, uh, you're going to have the power tie of the month and you're just going to be the, the, the cat's meow. Jeff is my commentary section over there. He, he's, he's got sound effects for everything. Go ahead, brother. Hallelujah. Preach the word 
Be, give, give it whether it's in season, out of season, whether it's convenient or not, whether it's welcome or not, whether they want to hear it or not. Listen to this. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy to do. Now, you people who say, don't ever say anything, we just preach love. Listen to what Paul tells Timothy to do. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. This is the last chapter or the last few words of the, the beloved apostle Paul, the preacher of grace, to his protege, giving him instruction because he knows he's about to leave and he's going to leave this young minister behind, this young pastor behind, and here's his charge. Preach the word, be yes and in season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. We can just stop, go home, and say that's enough. All right? Reprove is the Greek alanexon, and it means to correct or convince. Okay? A rebuke is ep epitemison, and, it mean, uh, and it, it's a term denoting censure. That is not a positive word. You've been censured. Then exhort means to exhort or encourage, depending on the context. Reprove and rebuke are negative terms that denote correction and discipline in the Greek. Now, I don't care what you say. You can come at me with all your, your fake, goopity, gawky love mantra that, you know, only teach love and don't ever judge anybody and don't ever tell anybody they can't do whatever they want to do. And you're just setting people up for a fall. Because Paul said in his charge to Timothy, you rebuke them. And you reprove them. Yes, and exhort them. But two of the three was reprove and rebuke. We want to build people up. We want to encourage people. We want to lift them up. But when they're going contrary to wholesome doctrine, when they're violating the principles of the word of God, when they're violating the moral code of God, they have to be reproved and rebuked. Why? So that they can come into the fullness of what God has for them. Just telling people God loves them is not enough. They have to be disciplined. They have to be trained. They have to be governed through the word of God and how to walk out the purposes of God and the plan of God and walk out the, the thing that God has them. Yes, you love them. That's why we do it. It's a whole lot easier to tell people what they want to hear. It's great to go to somebody. I'm telling you right now. We used to have, a, there was a song out about 30 years ago in the Southern Gospel Arena called Please Let Me Sing in the Choir. And it was a, it was a get back song. And the song said, please let me sing in the choir, in the choir. Please let me sing in the choir. And, this, and, and of course, they, you know how they do it with Southern Gospel. They'll, they'll tell a story with the song. And there was Uncle, Uncle Charlie, whoever he was, always wanted to be in the choir, but they wouldn't let him in. There's a reason. He could not sing. Okay? But that's what he wanted to do. You know, folks, if you can't, if you're not, if you're not qualified, then you don't, you don't need to do that. You need to find what you're gifted and called to do. Well, I want to sing. Well, I, there, there, were, there were preachers or teachers back in the healing revival who wanted to teach and couldn't teach and cost them their life, cost them the ministry early. There's a whole doctrine called by the name of the last person, somethingism. Because he got out, the, he, he uh, uh, Brother Lindsay, Gordon Lindsay went to him and said, Brother so-and-so, you're not, you're not anointed to teach. Yeah, but I want to. And his whole doctrine got off to a place, and let me say, he could line nine deaf people up or dumb people up, lay hands on them, and instantly all of them could hear or speak. Nine out of ten, every time. Had a gift, had, a, had, a, had one of the gifts of healings working in, predominantly along the lines of hearing and speaking. The deaf and the mute. Instant, line them up, boom, 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 get instantly healed. But he started teaching some stuff that was out in the field. And the word of the Lord came to Brother Hagin then that year and said, hey, heir, he who stands at the forefront of the healing ministry will not be here at the end of the year. Not that he won't be here, he'll be absent from the earth. He took that, wrote it down, took it to Brother Lindsay, and Brother Lindsay put it in his vault. Kept that. Well, on the, uh, about the 25th, 6th, somewhere, somewhere around near the end of the year, he was in a, a really, really bad automobile accident. 
And they were at a meeting somewhere. It was right, it was right after Christmas. We were there at a meeting somewhere. And um, the, 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 there was a convention of, of these kind of ministries. And they said, Brother so-and-so has been in a, in a very, very bad, in, 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 in critical condition. Let's all come up here and pray. Well, he got up. He kind of forgotten about that prophecy. He got up went and started heading down the front. And the Lord said, don't you go pray. He stopped. Turned around, went back to his seat. He said, was on his way. I said, why, Lord? He said, well, didn't I tell you that he who stands at the forefront will not be here at the end of the year? Yeah, they're all there praying he'll live and not die. Well, that December 31st, before midnight, he passed away. Next time Brother Hagin and Brother Lindsay got together, he said, Brother Hagin, you remember that? What you? He went and got it out of his vault. He said, you remember? You? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Lord told me not to pray for him when they all got together and tried to pray. He said he's going to die. Why? Because he tried to do something he wasn't called to do. Even though he, and he knew it. But he just wanted to. Now listen, I, there, there are ministries I just, I stand in awe of because, it's, because of the gift. But you know what? That's not my calling. So I have to let them walk in their calling and be blessed in it and just enjoy, enjoy what they have from God because that's their gift to the body. Amen. Well, Uncle Charlie wanted to sing. And he couldn't sing. That's a, whole, that's a whole side journey there. He wanted to sing. And, you know, of course, one day they come to church. He's dead, but, you know, because he passed away and went home to be with Jesus. And they were all sitting in the church service worshiping. And all of a sudden they heard a heavenly voice come down in the middle of the choir. Please let me see. It was Uncle Charlie. He had gone to heaven. Now he's singing in the heavenly choir. They, uh, it's a get back song now this is the mindset we end up in the church well if I want to do it for the Lord then I should be able to do it not if you're not qualified or gifted in that arena amen I said not if you're not qualified or gifted in that arena you don't need to be doing it yeah but I want to that's what I want to do well if you, look, if you can't sing you can't, if you can't play the piano you can't play the piano you don't want me getting up there leading worship on the piano It wouldn't be a joyful noise. It wouldn't, I don't know if it would be a glad racket. <laughs> to the ears of the hearers, it would be, it would be horrid. Okay? How do we get off on all that? We'll reprove and rebuking. Why are we to reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering? Verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. When we start catering to the, P, the Christian PC crowd and everything's about love. And it's not, see, when they say that, it just, it just irks me because it's not true Bible love. I say that's not true Bible love. Or y'all here, you go home. It's, it's a mantra that the world, it's basically Christian tolerance of every whacked out thing on the planet well, I'm a homosexual Christian. I'm a lesbian Christian. I'm a transgender Christian. No, no, and no, you're not. One, one minister, one really well-known minister woman, and she's been through a mess in the past few years. Her husband divorced her, and she's remarried. Her husband got up and told a church for all the Christian women to go get porn and look at it to spice up their marriage. Said it publicly with children in the room. And she, didn't do it. she should have jumped up and said, I bind you in Jesus' name. But no, she just kind of laughed it off and went on about her business. You don't recommend porn to anybody. Privately, publicly, any other way. Did you know that the word porn comes from the Latin fornex, which means to incite to lust? You're going to help, help women to go incite themselves to lust. Well, anyway, somebody shout glory be to God. Somebody shout, say Jesus is good. <laughs> Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. All right. Now, so he's to reprove, rebuke, exhort what? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. That means to bear up or have a mind or patience to receive sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they'll heap to themselves teachers. Having itching ears. Woo! Are we living in that day? You go find somebody who teaches what you want to hear and you start quoting them for everything. 
No soundness to it, no doctrine, no biblical doctrine to it. They'll even say things like, you'll listen to him for 30 minutes, you won't even hear him use the Bible. God told me, God showed me. Well, God told you and God showed you from where? Because I can find scripture that goes exactly against what you just said. And I don't mean one or two isolated ones, I mean mainline scripture. Well, I'm going to say, he says it. You know, that, they had people, my, my girls were out in Oklahoma, they had people going around dropping books off of people's steps because they were, you know, this teacher was the one that had all the revelation. It even got to the point, they found out there's a group that print, started printing Bibles without 1 John 1, 9 in it, saying that all the scholars, of Greek scholars now say it wasn't in the original text. You mean the, the three that they like? Or the two that they like? Not all scholars say all. I mean, it's all, that sounds powerful. All Greek scholars now agree. No, they don't. And besides, I'm not going to jump on bad wagon just because somebody comes along here 2,000 years later and says they think the Greek says this when we had uh, 17, 18, 1900 years of scholarly research saying it differently. And now you're going to come along here and say, I've got, I've got more revelation than they. How could you have more? Anyway. Sheesh. Paul was warning of a future time when opposition to the gospel would be flagrant. Men would not endure that. It's bear up, put up with the minor patience to receive sound doctrine. They would heap, accumulate teachers who would say things that would tickle their ears. And here, the idea of itching ears, having itching ears. The idea of, oh boy, are we living in this time. And this was, this was a commentary written um, 20, 25 years ago, some of this. The idea behind itching ears is that of entertainment. Such people want their ears tickled with sensational, stimulating oratory. And now they want sensational and stimulating uh, music productions. I can't even call it worship. It's a musical production. There's one of the most well-known churches in the world. Their London-based church just did a special last Christmas. And on Silent Night, the girl comes out in a mini fluffy, a mini feathered skirt with a top that's cropped right at the top of the skirt. Huh? It was a Las Vegas-style show. I mean, pure, the girls were dressed like Las Vegas almost. And when they pick her up, you can see her butt cheeks. And she's singing Silent Night, Holy Night. And when it, got, when it finally hit the internet, they got so much flat, they took it down. Now if anybody puts it up, they, they call it, they scream, you know, uh, copyright infringement. Because they don't want anybody to see what they're doing. Then this, this should have never been done. Under, in the name of Christianity? In the name of Silent Night, Holy Night? Which is a song, it's, it's, not, it's not a Vegas song. Hello? But the done, done, under the guise of ministry. Now, did they do a good job musically and so forth? Yeah, but it was choreographed like, like a Hollywood musical. And they were dressed like they were Vegas strip clubs. I'd be embarrassed to take my children to a Christmas production where you could see the butt cheeks of the woman singing when they picked her up and spun her around in the musical pro whatever. As a matter of fact, I'd be embarrassed to go see that, but I was sitting there with my wife. She ain't going to be looking at someone with a woman's backside. Hello? But we like itching ears. We like entertainment. And Paul said, rebuke, rebuke, reprove, and exhort. Why? Because a time is coming where men are not going to endure sound doctrine. They're going to heap teachers to themselves. And they all run out and say, we reach people. We get people in the building. <clears throat> I read the ministry of Jesus, and Jesus did not bring people in the building because he had a great worship team. They came in because of one, the anointing. He was anointed by the Holy Ghost with power. And he went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. He walked in a power. He walked in an authority. He walked in an anointing that set the captives free. And that's what people came to get. Not a Hollywood movie production or Hollywood you know, cabaret production under the guise it's Christian. Hello. 
Now listen, there were years ago, remember when they used to bring the dance teams out? The girls would come out in leotards. I remember, there's a lot of people, oh, we got, we, we got to understand people who are artsy. The men ain't looking at them because they're artsy. They're looking at the leotard. They're looking at the skin tight leggings and stuff that they're bouncing around in. Hello? Are y'all with me? You go home. But everybody, you know, we, we got, we've got to be open. No, I'm not open. Straight is the way and narrow is the gate that leads to eternal life. Well, hallelujah. They will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Hallelujah. So, and they should, listen to verse 4. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. They're going to turn away from the truth and turn unto fables. Um, they turn their ears, this suggests a deliberate refusal to hear the truth of the gospel. And when they did this, they turned to fables, myths. But then Paul charges Timothy, but watch thou in all things. Okay, be sober. Endure afflictions. Um, do the work of an evangelist. That means, you know, be a messenger of the good things of God. Make full proof of thy ministry. And that, that is, content, fulfill your ministry. Fully perform the duties of your ministry. And then Paul moves, he shifts a little bit here. He begins talking about, for I'm now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. Paul says, I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. I mean, I, I finished my course. I've kept the faith. He didn't say I'm done. He said, I finished my course. Okay? Henceforth. Why? Because he, kept, he fought a good fight. He kept the faith. All right? Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give them at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that also love him in his appearance. Now, this is Paul saying this. Timothy, you know, you follow my footsteps. Remember Paul wrote earlier, he says, follow me as I follow the Lord. Okay? He says, the Lord's going to give me a judge. He's going to give me a crown. But not just to me. He's going to give it to everybody who, who, who walks these things out this way. And then he begins a little personal note. Do your diligence to come to me shortly. For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed in Thessalonica, uh, Croesus to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark. Here's, uh, <laughs> take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. So here Paul is. He's at the very end. He says, okay, Mark has got his act together. Bring him. I, I, I have to believe Paul wanted to impart something into him in that last bit before he, went, before he, he was offered up and was beheaded. I, you know, bring Mark. He's profitable to me to the ministry now. We're going to, you know, he, he got it together. He got it straight. Now, before I leave, I want him to know. I recognize uh, he, he's, got, he's got his act turned around. Um, and Titus, have I sent to Ephesus? And I'm probably blowing these names. The cloak that I left at Troas with Capris, and when thou comest, bring with thee. And he left something he wanted to, you know, people, people, when they know they're about to leave, they, they want kind of, they kind of organize their stuff, you know? And, um, uh, and um, the books, but especially the parchments. There's things Paul had written he wanted to make sure he got a hold of. Okay? Now listen to this. Here's the love of God in manifestation in the new church era. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. You people don't read your Bible. Come on. Read your Bible. We just... We walk around like ostriches with our heads stuck in the ground and say some of the dumbest stuff and put it on Facebook like you're an authority. And ab about 90% of the time, anybody that's, that's, that's well-versed in Scripture can blow you out of the water. But then the argument always comes back, you're not, who are you to judge me? I'm God's, or, you know, you, you're, you're walking in hate. That, that's, that's, that's what the world does. You're a homophobe. You're transphobic now. That's the new term. Well, when are you going to become a minor attracted adult phobic? And they scare me because they're perverts. They're, I mean, they're, 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 they're perversion on steroids. 
That's the, by the way, that's the new term for pedophiles. The psychological world is now deeming them minor attracted adults. I read it in a journal. They don't want to call them pedophiles. That makes them look bad. So now they're minor attracted adults. Like, what happens? You change the terminology, you change the view of it. How many know what abortion was like before the term pro-choice came into existence? This country was vehemently anti-abortion. But when the demon-inspired abortion industry got a hold of a mantra that pro-choice and then started men are trying to control women's reproductive rights and they filter this stuff through the college campuses through the left-wing radical nutbag progressive socialist Marxist communist human secularist professors huh atheists. atheists yeah well human secularism is atheism yeah that, their, their religion is atheism so that got them anyway <laughs> Then all of a sudden the polls begin to change because the women says, who are you to control my body? Well, that life in you is not your body. It's another life. And you've been given the privilege to nurture it. But it is a, it is a separate entity. It has its own blood supply. Well, we'll just leave that there. But by changing the, the, the conversation from pro-abortion and anti-abortion to pro-choice, they change all the public opinion and everything. That's why these people are trying to change pedophilia. See, you know, we call them pedophiles. They change it so they can call them minor attracted adults. Then it becomes palatable. Doing the same exact thing, but by changing the terminology, they change perspective. Because these people are full of the devil who do this. About 90% of your college professors are demon possessed, I believe. They're full of the devil. They have an agenda. Anyway. Anyway. The books were papyrus, you know, writing material, parchments were made from animal skins, da 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 da. Okay. Um, so Alexander the Coppersmith didn't much evil, and Paul says, he said, just reward him according to his works. Of whom he uh, be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. One, one translation says, he's violent. He's fought against every word. He's against our teachings. Uh, you know. Um, th now listen. Reward him according to his, his works. This is the Bible teaching divine payment. God. Do y'all not understand that when Paul was on his way to Damascus with letters to throw the people in the jail, that Jesus showed up? Listen, he did not show up for a chit chat. Let me tell you what was going to happen that day. Paul was going to get saved or he was going to hell. This was, not, this, was not a, this was not a discussion. This was not Jesus being polyphobic. Or persophobic. He's persecuting the church. This is Jesus saying, I've had enough of your stuff. He knocked him off the horse. I mean, he just reached out and said, slap! I say, I say, boy, you bother me, boy. You bother me. Follow corner that corner? And, he, he, and, Jesus, and Paul goes, who are thou, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus, whom, you're pers whom you persecute. Now, how thought he's persecuting the church? Jesus took it personal. And then he said this, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Let me come and kind of modernize that for you. You're in a heap of trouble, boy. You've been messing with my church. You're messing with me. Now, Paul being the intellectual, very, very, very wise man that he was, immediately goes, what would you have me to do? He 
He committed his life to the Lordship of Jesus. Called him Lord. Believe God raised his days. Looking at him. And decided that submission was a better part of valor at the moment. What would you have me to do? And then he told him what to do and he would, he would show him the things and so forth. And then Paul, my first answer, no man stood with him. That was when he first brought before Caesar, no man stood with him. All forsook me. Then he says, I, I pray that no one, this not be laid to their charge. In other words, I don't want them to be, you know, whatever for it. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me, strengthened me. That by my preaching might be fully known that all the Gentiles might hear. Remember, he's, he's carried to Rome. So the gospel is carried to Rome so that everybody can hear it. I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. And then to whom be glory forever and ever. Salute Priscilla, Pris, Prisca, and Apollo, Aquila, and the household of Onesphorus. Aristus abode at Corinth, but Trophus have I left at Miletum sick. Do thy diligence to come before winter. A, a Eubulus greeteth thee, and Prudus, and Linus, and Claudia, and all the brethren. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be unto you. Amen. So the last few verses are closing comments and so forth. But in this last chapter, Paul charges Timothy. He gives him a charge. I, I can't think why the church. Well, I can because people like the money. They like being popular. They like being liked. Preachers like to be liked. I like being liked. People don't, I mean, sometimes people don't like me, and I don't like not being liked, but you know what? I can't, I can't compromise because you don't like it. Because I have to answer to someone who knocks people off the horse if he gets mad with them. <laughs> oh, Jesus, don't do that anymore. Yeah, right. You don't believe Jesus can, can rebuke you and reprove you? He'll, in a heartbeat, why? Because the work of God and the purpose of God must be fulfilled. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, hope you all got, and got blessed and enjoyed. And, of course, we don't have it written in Scripture, but Paul was eventually there in, in, in his imprisonment in Rome, was, was beheaded. Um, Peter was crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to be crucified like his Lord. That's what he told him, just turn me upside down. All right? And uh, so we've now finished the life and teachings of Paul. This two-year series. So the next time we meet on a Wednesday night, which is next week, um, in the new year, we'll be starting something different. The life and teachings of Philemon. I'll ask that one service. <laughs> Maybe half a service. That was just trying to be funny. All right. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.